great writers of mystery and suspense fiction. It would probably include authors like Edgar Allan Poe, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Agatha Christie, Georges Simenon, Ed McBain, John le Carré, Sarah Paresky, and many others. These are all undoubtedly great writers. And they are also, like the vast majority of other authors of mystery and suspense fiction, white. The whiteness of most mystery and suspense fiction is generally taken for granted. The focus of this lecture, as well as a few other lectures in this series, is to change that situation by examining the contribution that races, that writers from other races and ethnicities have made to the genre. Texts by black writers, for example, not only illuminate the whiteness of the genre, but also innovate that genre by demonstrating that foundational issues like guilt, innocence, and justice can look very different when seen from an African-American perspective. We'll see that some black mystery writers explore the racialized nature of the justice system by examining it from the perspective of black characters. Other writers explore the ambiguous position of black law enforcement officers and detectives, representatives of a system that is deeply biased. The work of all these writers shows that the addition of an African-American perspective transforms the genre's understanding of its foundational terms. What do justice, innocence, and guilt mean in the context of a society that is in some ways fundamentally unjust? Reconstructing the origins of any subgenre within mystery and suspense fiction is always complicated, and black mystery fiction is no exception to this rule. Some critics point to the work of Pauline Hopkins as the first example of an African-American mystery narrative. In such novels as Contending Forces and Of One Blood, this prolific and influential author often explores the difficulties faced by African Americans, and especially the racist violence of the Reconstruction period after the American Civil War. But in her 1900 short story, Talma Gordon, and her novel, Hagar's Daughter, which was serialized in the Colored American Magazine between 1901 and 1902, Critics such as Stephen Soitos have located substantial use of detective fiction conventions. According to Soitos in his important book, The Blues Detective, Hagar's Daughter is the first African-American detective novel. It tells the story of the apparent murder of white aristocrat Ellis Anson by his brother St. Clair, and the apparent suicide of the mulatto Hagar and the death of her young daughter by drowning. Soitos adds that Hopkins was the first African-American writer to utilize detective fiction for a social and political attack on racial discrimination in the United States. There's no doubt that the publication of Hagar's Daughter is a landmark in the history of black mystery fiction, and yet I hesitate to call it the first African-American detective novel. Why? Because, as Soitos admits, the detective figures don't really make an appearance until the last third of the novel. Everything that happens in Hagar's Daughter before that point represents the kind of melodramatic romance for which Hopkins was deservedly well known, rather than a detective novel proper. Even though Hopkins is responsible for the first sustained use of detective fiction conventions by an African-American writer, I'm not sure we can describe her as the first black mystery writer with any degree of accuracy. A much better case can be made for a novel published in 1932 by Rudolf Fischer entitled The Conjurman Dies, a mystery tale of dark Harlem. Note the subtitle. Part of what makes this novel's claim to be the first African-American detective novel so compelling is that it is explicitly marketed as a mystery narrative 
And in addition, it concerns the investigation of a crime from beginning to end. Conjure Man provides a solid foundation upon which later black mystery writers could build. Fisher was born in Washington, D.C. in 1897. After graduating from Brown University, he attended medical school at Howard University and graduated in 1924. He moved to New York City in 1925 after earning a fellowship at the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University and subsequently practiced medicine until his untimely death at the age of 37. Fisher's career as a writer began in 1925 with the publication of the short story City of Refuge, and he went on to publish a number of other stories and play an active role in the artistic and literary movement known as the Harlem Renaissance. The Conjure Man Dies tells the story of the apparent murder of Ingana Frimbo, a Harvard-educated African king who moves to Harlem and sets up business as a conjure man or traditional healer. When Jinx Jenkins goes to consult the conjure man and Frimbo is apparently murdered during their meeting, Jinx finds himself in jail and in desperate need of help. That help comes in a variety of forms. Bubba Brown, who uses his informal detective skills and his knowledge of the community to help exonerate his friend. John Archer, a stand-in for Fisher himself, who is a doctor called in to examine the body of the dead man, and the police detective Perry Dart, who assists Archer in finding a solution to the complicated mystery. There are several features of The Conjure Man Dies that make it especially significant in the history of black mystery fiction. First, all the main characters, including the victim, suspects, and a variety of detectives are African American. There are no white saviors in the narrative and no white outsiders that enter the community of Harlem. Second, Fisher explores the complexity and richness of his Harlem setting in a way few other writers and certainly no white writers were doing at the time. Third, because Fisher anticipated a mostly white audience for his novel, he deliberately set out to write not only a compelling mystery, but also a book that would combat stereotypes and educate his readers about both African Americans and their culture. Fisher had hoped to write other novels featuring the detective duo of Perry and Dart. He once stated that he would be very happy to become known as Harlem's interpreter to people outside the community, that is, white Americans. Unfortunately, Fisher died after unsuccessful abdominal surgery before he could realize that ambition. In some ways, Chester Himes became the interpreter of Harlem that Fisher wished to be, but under circumstances that Himes couldn't have anticipated and that perhaps he didn't even desire. Chester Himes was born in Jefferson City, Missouri in 1909. He began writing while he was serving a 20-year sentence for armed robbery at the Ohio State Penitentiary. Although he started his writing career by focusing on short stories, after he was released in 1936, he began to write novels. His first novel, If He Hollers Let Him Go, was published in 1945 and was quickly followed by Lonely Crusade in 1947. Critic Mike Davis has described these two novels as L.A. Noir for the way they focus on crimes committed by black men in desperate circumstances after they moved to the West Coast to find work during the Second World War. Although Davis's categorization is thought-provoking, I think it's more accurate to describe the novels written during the first stage of Himes' career, novels that also include The Third Generation, Cast the First Stone, and The End of a Primitive, as social realism in the manner of Richard Wright's influential novel, Native Son. Although Himes enjoyed some success as a writer of protest novels, 
His work was also quite controversial, both because of its bleakness and because it explored interracial relationships in an explicit and honest manner. Depressed by this controversy and convinced that the racial situation in the United States was never going to improve, Himes decided in the mid-1950s to become an expatriate and emigrate to Europe, where he would spend the rest of his life, first in France and then in Spain. Indirectly, it was this move to Europe that made Himes a crime fiction writer. Like many other well-known authors in the field, including David Goodis and Jim Thompson, Himes had never planned to write mysteries, but economic circumstances forced him to do so. When Himes first arrived in Paris, he was more or less flat broke. Soon after his arrival, the well-known editor, Marcel Duhamel, approached Himes and asked him if he'd like to write a crime novel to be published in Siri Noir, the crime fiction series Duhamel had launched soon after the end of the Second World War. Although Himes had never thought about writing crime fiction before and was initially reluctant to try, he accepted Duhamel's invitation. And the result was the publication of For Love of Imabel, also known as The Five-Cornered Square and A Rage in Harlem, which was published in 1957. Imabel became the first of a series of crime novels Himes wrote over the next 12 years that collectively became known as the Harlem Domestic Series. Together, they comprise the single most significant contribution to black mystery fiction from any author. What is it that makes Himes' work so important? Let's begin by considering the setting of these novels. Like Rudolf Fischer in The Conjure Man Dies, Himes emphasizes the complexity and richness of Harlem culture, but he is able to do so with a level of detail and depth that Fischer never had the chance to achieve. All of Himes' crime novels are filled with descriptions of food, music, and street culture that contribute nothing to the development of the plot, but which paint a rich three-dimensional picture of black urban life in the middle decades of the 20th century. Himes' protagonists, the black homicide detectives, Gravedigger Jones and Coffin Ed Johnson, are among the most memorable characters in all of mystery and suspense fiction. They are violent, street smart, and passionately committed to protecting the poor and vulnerable members of the Harlem community from threats emanating from both inside and outside that community. It's no exaggeration to say that Gravedigger and Coffin Ed are crusaders for justice. But Himes never idealizes either them or their situation. Gravedigger and Coffin Ed sometimes go too far and make mistakes, and Himes frequently emphasizes the difficulties of their situation as black police officers in Harlem. From the perspective of many residents of Harlem, Gravedigger and Coffin Ed are not to be trusted by virtue of the fact that they work for the man. But from the perspective of white police officers, Gravedigger and Coffin Ed are resented, even hated, both because they are so good at their job and because they are perceived as being favored over white officers. Through Gravedigger and Coffin Ed, Himes explores the difficulties and contradictions inherent in African Americans representing a judicial system that is frequently unjust and prejudicial. What enables Himes' protagonists to keep their eyes on the prize is their commitment to doing whatever they can to help their fellow black Americans. Although the Harlem Domestic Series is unflinching in its exploration of the sordid and violent aspects of Harlem, it would be inaccurate to describe these novels as realistic in the usual sense of that word. Why? Because Himes' crime novels are defined above all by absurdity, a concept that is crucial to understanding Himes' work as a whole. 
It's worth quoting Himes at length at this point. Here is what he says in his autobiography about writing Immobel, his first crime novel. I would sit in my room and become hysterical thinking about the wild, incredible story I was writing. But it was only for the French, I thought, and they would believe anything about Americans, black or white, if it was bad enough. And I thought I was writing realism. It never occurred to me I was writing absurdity. Realism and absurdity are so similar in the lives of American blacks, one cannot tell the difference. This is an incredibly rich passage for a number of reasons. First, it emphasizes the way in which Himes found writing crime fiction to be a liberating experience. It allowed him to say all the things he wanted to say in a way he'd never been able to say them before. Second, it underlines the fact that these novels were, at least in Himes's mind, written primarily for a white European audience, which meant that he felt free to say whatever he wanted. And third, Himes's emphasis on the symbiotic relationship between realism and absurdity in the lives of African Americans helps explain the way in which his crime novels are able to combine wildly over-the-top violence with searing social critique. Realism and absurdity are not in conflict in Himes' work. Instead, they complement and enrich each other. Himes is one of my very favorite authors, and I could say much more about him. But I want to move on to another writer who, while not exactly influenced by Himes, certainly deserves to be compared to him in terms of his popularity and influence, Walter Mosley. Mosley was born in California in 1952 and came to write in relatively late in life after working a variety of jobs. While working for Mobile Oil in New York City in the mid-80s, Mosley took a writing class at City College in Harlem after having been inspired by Alice Walker's novel, The Color Purple. Since he began writing at the age of 34, he has written every day and has published dozens of books. In fact, when I interviewed Mosley a few years ago and asked him about his writing routine, he made it sound ridiculously easy. Just sit down and write for a few hours every day. If only it were that simple for all of us. Mosley published his first novel, Devil in a Blue Dress, in 1990. And in it, he introduces his most famous series character, Easy Rawlins. Earlier, I mentioned that it would be inaccurate to say that Mosley was influenced by Chester Himes, and a closer look at Devil in a Blue Dress will show you what I mean. Mosley doesn't choose a cop as his protagonist, but rather the most amateur of amateur detectives. In fact, at the beginning of Devil, Easy is unemployed until a white man named DeWitt Albright hires him to find a young woman named Daphne Monet. Why does Albright hire Easy? Because Easy knows the community of Watts in Los Angeles, and Albright doesn't. This is the first of many times in Mosley's novels that Easy's knowledge of his community will come in handy. By the end of the novel, Easy has more or less succeeded in what he set out to do. But more important, from this point on, he thinks of himself as a detective and carries that identity with him into later novels. Another significant difference between Himes and Mosley concerns their use of setting. Although they both set their work in black areas of large American cities, Harlem and Watts, respectively, Himes's novels are set in the same time period in which he was writing, while Mosley's Easy Rawlins novels are historical mysteries. The first is set in 1948, and the other novels move gradually through the 1950s and 1960s until Rose Gold, the 13th novel in the series, which is set in the Black Power era of the late 1960s. Why is this a significant difference? 
because it illustrates the fact that Mosley uses his Easy Rawlings novels to write an alternative history of American life and Los Angeles. But in what ways is this history alternative? Partly in the sense that black people are at the center of Mosley's version of American history in a way that isn't true of mainstream history. But also in the sense that Mosley's Los Angeles is meant to be a stark contrast to the city found in the work of a hard-boiled writer like Raymond Chandler. Unlike Himes, part of Mosley's ambition is to take the classic hard-boiled version of the city and show us what that city looks like from a black perspective. This means not only that we see aspects of the city that we wouldn't find in the work of white writers, but also we get a very different kind of detective. Although Mosley's work is recognizably hard-boiled in the sense that there's lots of violence, intrigue, and corruption, in Mosley's plots, Easy Rawlings is not a loner in the way that Philip Marlowe tends to be. Not only does Easy have a family, that family frequently dictates what cases he takes on and how he investigates them. And Easy is also connected to the community of Watts as a whole. As the series progresses, we see more and more evidence that for Easy, being a detective does not mean being isolated and cynical. Rather, it means being a community resource, someone who's committed to helping people in need in the community around him. In Mosley's novels, black mystery fiction views crime not just in terms of challenges and solutions, but also in terms of justice in a much broader and more ethical sense. It's no accident that one Easy Rawlings novel, Little Scarlet, takes place against the background of the 1965 Watts riots. Easy's investigation of the murder of the title character may not be able to stop the riots, but he might be able to prevent further violence from erupting in the community. It's hard to imagine being able to say the same thing about Philip Marlowe. The contributions of female writers to black mystery and suspense fiction have been just as diverse and significant as those of their male counterparts. Like Walter Mosley, Barbara Neely came to writing later in life, but in her case, it was because she worked as a political activist for many years, including designing and directing Pennsylvania's first community-based correctional facility for women. Neely draws upon her experiences as an activist in a series of books featuring a black female domestic worker called Blanche White. The first novel in the series, Blanche on the Lamb, appeared in 1992 and was followed by Blanche Among the Talented Tenth, which deals with the issue of colorism within the African-American community, Blanche Cleans Up, which is set in Boston and looks at environmental justice, and Blanche Passes Go, in which Neely tackles the problem of violence against women. As these summaries indicate, in her work, Neely uses mystery fiction to address a wide range of political and social issues. The same is true of her debut novel, Blanche on the Lamb, in which Neely uses Blanche's status as a taken-for-granted domestic worker in a white family to comment on the invisibility of black women in white society. Neely also demonstrates that Blanche's invisibility allows her to have a unique perspective on white society, a perspective that helps make her an effective detective. The novel begins with Blanche skipping town in order to avoid being sentenced to 30 days in jail for writing bad checks. This crime symbolizes the economic necessity that defines Blanche's life as a single black mother. When she takes a job as a maid with a well-to-do white family, Blanche becomes more and more curious about the strange goings-on in the house and eventually plays a decisive role in capturing a killer and seeing justice done. 
In Neely's hands, a marginal individual turns out to be a capable and creative crime solver. In her series of novels featuring Tamara Hale, an ex-cop turned private investigator who is also a single mom, Valerie Wilson Wesley takes a somewhat different approach. As befits Hale's professional identity as a PI, Wesley sets all her novels in the tough and economically depressed city of Newark, New Jersey, which gives her work a marked resemblance to hard-boiled fiction in the style of Raymond Chandler and Chester Himes. This means not only that the knowledgeable reader can appreciate the similarities and differences between Hale and her male counterparts, but also that Hale can explore a number of urban-related social issues in her work, including urban decay, black-on-black -black violence, and police indifference to crime when black people are the victims. For example, in the first novel in the series, When Death Comes Stealing, which was published in 1994, Hale is approached by her ex-husband and the father of her son, when his other sons are being killed off one by one by a mysterious assailant. Even though Hale has a bad relationship with her ex, to put it mildly, she feels compelled to help. Why? Both because the police are showing little interest in these crimes, and because she's afraid that the killer will eventually turn his or her attention to her own son. This last detail is worth stressing, because Wilson's mysteries often involve Hale and her family being threatened or endangered in some way. This means that in her work, the toughness of the stereotypical private eye is combined with the vulnerability and emotion of the black single mother who is trying to protect her family. It's this combination that gives Wilson's work much of its power and innovativeness. Attica Locke has a somewhat different relationship to mystery and suspense fiction. Rather than writing a series of crime novels featuring the same character, Locke uses the genre's conventions to explore a wide range of political issues in ambitious and politically engaged realist novels. In Locke's own words, I think I get away with a lot of political stuff because of the presence of a dead body. If you have familiar signposts along the way, this is when the cops get called, this is when we tell the girl's parents, readers get comfortable, and then you can slide in all this other material. What other material is Locke referring to? Her debut novel, Black Water Rising, which came out in 2009, and her third novel, Pleasantville, which was published in 2015, are both set in Houston and feature Jay Porter, a formal civil rights activist who has now become a small-time lawyer. Locke uses Porter not only to explore issues of social justice in a black urban setting, but also to examine what has been gained and what has been lost for black people in the time between the rebellious years of the 1960s and the more mainstream status of African Americans in American society today. From Locke's perspective, that process of mainstreaming can come at a price, and that price is too much compromising of the revolutionary ideals that defined the earlier period. That same tension between present and past is also a feature of Locke's second novel, The Cutting Season, which takes place on a Louisiana plantation that's been turned into a tourist attraction and event space. When a murder with historical resonances takes place on the plantation, Locke has the perfect setting to explore connections between this individual murder in the present and the massive historical crime of slavery in the past. Locke's work is typical of the creative and thought-provoking ways in which African-American authors have used mystery and suspense fiction. In the work of these writers, the genre explores issues of guilt, innocence, and justice in a variety of contexts and settings. In the process, 
Not only does black mystery fiction illuminate the whiteness of the rest of the genre, it also suggests how and why the genre can be taken in innovative and productive new directions in the future.